Last week I began a new sermon series entitled Gentle and Lowly, taken from the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, where Jesus calls us to come unto him, calls us to himself, come unto me with a promise of rest for our souls. And in that passage, he reveals his heart towards us. Did anybody think about that this week? Did anybody think, you know, I want to run to Jesus this week. I want to go towards him because he's calling me to him. He's gentle and lowly towards us. This is uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am, here's the part where he tells us his heart towards us, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We begin this series by me asking you to try to get in touch with a feeling, a feeling that shows up right here. It's a pit of the pit of your stomach feeling. It's that feeling of, oh no. I'm in trouble, right? And I used a couple of stories from my life to illustrate that when I backed the forklift up into the, the rafters of the lumber yard. Oh no, I'm in trouble. But in theological terms, that, that feeling is, is a feeling of guilt and condemnation. Now, some of us are more prone to that than others. Some of us uh, are more prone because we, we're people pleasers. Um, and so we're, we're always thinking and worried about what people will think about us. Oh, I've messed up. I've done the wrong thing. Um, my mother is really one of those, has been all of her life. And so I've, I've got a lot of that. We were, Des and I were talking about that last night. Um, there's something called a prohibitive conscience that we learned about when we were doing parenting classes that, um, some children have a prohibitive conscience. They are always thinking they're going to be in trouble. They're always worried about getting in trouble. Uh, even when they're good. And a lot of times they're really good because they're always worried about it. Um, and we can, we can have that. It's a feeling of I'm guilty and I'm due punishment. And if I'm not now, I'm going to be because I know, I know who I am. I'm filled with fear and I have no confidence because of it. Now we know that as believers we have lots of scripture, we have lots of teaching, we've got a lot of the words of Christ and the other, the other apostles to us telling us that that's not how we should feel. And yet we do. We're told not to feel those things about coming to the Lord, about coming before the Lord. Right? All the, the fear nots in scripture, all the do not fears. All of the, the ones that says we have this confidence, we have this confidence before the Lord, we have it, it's ours, come boldly, all of the, all of that teaching. Here's a couple that you probably know, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not, it's not a real thing. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're not condemned by God because Christ was condemned on the cross. Christ was punished at the cross. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. So it's you it's not you don't it's not for you. God's not do, he he's not looking to punish you. If you're in Christ. And he wants everyone to be in Christ. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know that. Or this one from 1 John 4. This is 1 John 4 16 through 18. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Let's look at that again. We know and rely. Turn to your neighbor and say, know and rely. Know and rely. What do we know and rely on? We know and rely that we've been perfect. Is that what it says? No, we know and rely that we'll never make another mistake. It's not what it says. We know and rely on the love God has for us. For God so loved. Right? Didn't we sing it just a minute ago? That's what we know and rely on. The love God had, that it was shed for us. The blood that was shed for us because he's so loved. God is love. That's who, that's who he is. That's his identity. That's his nature. That's his characteristic. His, his driving force. Everything that, everything about him flows out of that. That's who he is. And guess what? Behavior flows from identity. His behavior flows from that identity. Now look at this verse or this phrase in this verse. Whoever lives in love 
lives in God because God is love. Lives in God and God in them. Whoever lives in love. Wouldn't you like to be able to think about your life and the way you live and say, man, I live in love. And, you know, a lot of us, we read that and we go, yeah, but I'm pretty bad at that. I I don't do that very well. It's not about your love. It's about his love for you. That's the love that we're to live in. And when we begin to live in his love for us, then we begin to improve in our love for him and our love for others. But it's not the other way around. First, we have to live in his love for us. Whoever lives in love. Remember my story about the sword of Damocles last week where the guy was sitting on the throne. He had the sword suspended over his head. He's always afraid of this coming death, the coming judgment, the coming thing that was going to fall on him. Living in love is the opposite of that. Because perfect love casts out fear. Let's go on here. Um, This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Now, this is a tricky verse to translate and to interpret and to apply. This is how that 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 starts with this. So what is that this referring to? If you look at the way that the translators of the NIV have structured this sentence, they put a colon after judgment. In other words, this here is how love is made complete in us so that we'll have confidence on the day of the, the This refers to that in this world, we are like Jesus. And if you read it that way, you'll think, well, okay, my confidence is in the fact that I'm like Jesus in this world. And the truth is, is I'm not very much like Jesus in this world, so I don't have very much confidence. I... So when I, when I come, when I come into contact of a verse like that, that makes me scratch my head and makes me go, now wait a minute. Is that really what the, is that saying that my confidence should be in my ability to be like Jesus? I don't think so because I know who wrote that verse. Paul wrote that verse. And what did Paul say? I don't have any confidence in my flesh. So I, I'm not smart, but I have books that are smart. Right? We don't need to know anything in the world anymore. We just have Google, right? We just look it up. But I, I have this this uh, this Greek uh, translator book for the whole entire New Testament that I pull out. So when I run into a verse like this, I go, that confuses me. I'm going to just pull this out and read what it says. And I'm, I'm going to read this to you so that you know how difficult it is for the... Tra- I'm not... I'm not I'm not running down the translator. I'm just telling you, it's a hard verse to translate. This is this is the way, so I'm not going to read the Greek words, but I'm going to read the English word for every Greek word in this verse. This is verse 17. In this has been perfected the love with us and that confidence we may have in the day of judgment, that even as that is, also we are in the world. So you have to... Because Greek sentence structure is different. You've got to figure out, okay, what goes with what? what which modifiers go with what? I would submit that the this in 17 points back to something in 16. Go back to 16. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Now go to 17. This, so living in love, living in God's love. This is how God's love, how love is made complete among us. The outcome of that is so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. New thought, standalone clause. In this world, we are like Jesus. Why? Because we're in him. It's not about me trying to be like Jesus. It's the fact that he's in me. It's Galatians 2.20. I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. Are you with me? Is this making any sense to you? Okay, let's finish it out. Verse 18. There is no fear in love. I'm pausing on purpose. I want you to think about that. There is no fear in love. Because perfect love, that kind of perfect love, that living in his love, that let love being made perfect in us so that we have confidence on the, on the day of judgment. So when we stand before the Lord, we, we have no condemnation. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. That's what we're afraid of. We're afraid of messing up. And we're going to get punished. But Jesus took our punishment. 
The one who fears has not been made perfect in love. And so that's me. That's me at the end. I fear. So I, I, so I know I got, I need to improve in this, but it's not about me improving me. It's about me getting a greater knowledge and a greater understanding and a greater reception of this love that God has for me. Right? Come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy loving. I'll give you rest. It's not about you. You're weary. I know you're weary. You've been trying to be good. You've been trying to do all the right things. You come to me and I'll give you rest. Not relying on my ability or my perfection because I don't have any, but totally relying on God's love for me. This is Paul's heart when he talks in, in Philippians 3 about, I have no confidence in the flesh, even though I have, I really have more right to do so than anybody else. You know, all of, all of my pedigree, all of my, my Jewish heritage and all of my perfection of being zealous and keeping the law, I might be able to, but he said, all that stuff I used to think was important, I now understand is rubbish. It's, you can't rely on that. That, if that's where you are, you're going to always be afraid of the sword of Damocles because you'll, you're going to mess up. He said, I don't, I don't put any confidence in my flesh anymore. So what did he say right before that and right after that? In, in Philippians chapter 2, he talks about have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus who humbled himself and took on the form of a man and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. There's my confidence. In the cross, in the cross. That's my confidence. So then in chapter 3, he says, I don't have any confidence in my flesh, but my confidence is end of chapter 3. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection. There's my confidence. This is how I know God loves me. Because he sent his only son for me, and he died for me, and he rose again, and he took all, he took all my guilt and all my shame and all my punishment. He took it away from me. Sadly, many of us live in fear. And that's not what God intended for us. It's not what he created us for. It's not why he, what he redeemed us for. He doesn't want us running from stuff. He wants us running to him. So let's get back to that window that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 11, that, that window into his heart. So that we can know his love for us better, which is exactly what Paul prayed for the church. Remember, we read that last week in Ephesians chapter three, that, that, that we might know how wide and how high and how deep and how long is the love of God and know this love that's past understanding. So we want to know Jesus heart. If Jesus heart towards sinners and sufferers is truly love and truly compassion if his, if his identity towards us is what he says it is, it's humble and lowly towards sinners and sufferers and people like me, then I would be able to look at his life and in his behavior because just like all the rest of us, his life reveals his heart. And I could see by looking at his life, how he lived, how he moved, how he interacted with sinners and sufferers, people who failed, how he reacted to their pain, all right, this morning we talked a lot about a lot of pain. How he dealt with the hurting and the lost. We can see his heart. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is walking along the road and a leper hollers out to him and he says, Lord, if you will, make me clean. If you will, you can make me clean. That's what he says. He says, I believe that you can, but my question, my if is, if you will. Don't we, isn't that how we feel about the Lord sometimes? We know he can do it, but our, the question is, is, if you will, do you really want to? And Jesus' response immediately was turned to him and said, I will be clean. He said four words, I will be clean. I want to heal you. I want to help you. That's my heart. That's my motivation. I want to help you. Is that how you see your relationship with Jesus? He wants to help you. 
when four friends bring their paralyzed companion to Jesus and they know he's in this house, but they can't get to him because it's surrounded by all these people who are trying to get to him. They, they say, okay, well, we're just going to take him up on the roof and we're going to take a shovel and dig a hole through this lady's shingles and lower him down. That's intercession, by the way. I'm going to bring my friend who needs Jesus before the Lord because I know if he gets before the Lord, the Lord will heal him. When he saw their faith, the Bible says, before they could even ask, he not only heals the man's paralytic condition, he forgives his sins, and he forgives the sins first. He says, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now get up, take thy mat, and walk. Before they even ask, he just sees their faith. How did he see their faith? Because he, they, he, they didn't say anything. He saw their faith because they were bringing their friend. They, 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 they were intent on getting that man before Jesus. I know that you know that I can heal him. And I want to heal him. That's what I want to do. The Bible says when he saw the crowds, he was filled with compassion for them. When he saw the crowds, they were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. When we see the crowds, is that our thought about the, the crowds? And when I'm talking about the crowds, I'm talking about the crowds that you see when you're, when you're flipping through the TV channels and you see Stupid people doing stupid things. Can I say that? <laughs> and that they're stupid. That they they seem like they're harassed. You know what Jesus Jesus thought about them? He didn't think. Why don't those people get it together? It said he was filled with compassion for them because he knew they were sheep without a shepherd. He knew they didn't know the truth. That's not how I think sometimes when I see the crowds. When he saw Martha crying over the loss of her brother, Lazarus, he was filled with compassion for her and even says that he wept. He didn't weep for his pain. He wept for her pain. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead. Just a few minutes later, he was weeping for her pain. Back in the early 90s when Bill Clinton was running for president and was president, it became kind of a cliche. He he had this he had this kind of talk where he would say, "I feel your pain," right? He, that was his gesture. I feel your pain, so much so that you know all the the people who impersonated him and all the Saturday Night Live people that became a a way of making fun of, the, of Bill Clinton. I feel your pain. Well, Jesus really does feel our pain. He really does. And I'm not. That's not even. That's not even just symbolic. That's literal. Because why? Because you are a part of Christ's body. First Corinthians twelve. You are you are He's the head and we're the body. That in your you may be a hand or a foot or an eye or an ear, but whatever we are, we're connected to His body. So if you're hurting, He's hurting. I mean, that's a big truth. That's a that's a deep truth. He hurts when you hurt. Last week I talked about the, the gentle and lowly and how that word lowly is used, gentle and lowly, is when, when he it speaks of him coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, riding on By the way, if, if, if you're getting impacted by this sermon, go back and listen to last week's too, if you missed that one. How he was gentle and lowly when he came into Jerusalem, riding on the colt, the foal of a donkey, that word gentle and lowly is used. And then we, then we jumped ahead to Revelation 19 where he's coming back on a white horse with a sharp sword and that robe dipped in blood and these two sort of competing images of Christ. But they're not competing. They're in, they work together. The fact that he knows that judgment is coming, that he knows that the, the sin is going to be judged gives him even greater compassion for the lost. The other time he, the scripture tells us that he cried was he wept over Jerusalem. That day, the day that he came in on the donkey, he, he sat on the Mount of Olives and he cried and he wept, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I wanted to save you. How oft I would have gathered you like a hen does her chicks, but you would not, you would not come, right? He says, come unto me, all you who are weak, but that there are those who won't come. And he weeps over those who won't come because he knows what's, what, what lies in store for them if they won't come. He's not willing that any should perish. And he knows the depth of what 
lies ahead for unsaved, lost humanity like none of us know. So he's even more drawn to reach out. He's even more drawn to love them. He's even more drawn to save them. It's impossible for us to make too much of the love of Christ. Now, it is possible that that's all you talk about and you leave out the judgment. And that's that's false doctrine. But it's impossible to, to, to make too much of the love of Christ. You can't overstate that. You can't over amplify that it, because it's, it's beyond our understanding. It's bigger than we can even talk about or think about. The love of Christ. He sees the terrible consequences of the fall that took place in the lives of men and women and children and young people and old people. In his heart, his deepest longing is to move towards the sinner and the sufferer in the midst of their mess, in the midst of their pain, and help them. Not away from them. And maybe you're ahead of me already and think, well, you know, if I'm a part of his body, that, that's probably what I should be doing too. Because that's what all ministry is. Ministry is meeting people at the point of their need. When Jesus moved towards these individuals that he encountered when he was on the earth who were suffering, often he did miracles. And we think of miracles as an interruption of the natural order, so much so that we call it supernatural. It's outside the natural realm. That's because we've come to, the only reference point we have is the only place we've ever lived is in this fallen world. And so what's normal to us, what's natural to us, is death and decay, destruction, suffering. So when Jesus does something that's outside of that, we say, oh, that's supernatural, and he, he restores it. But he's actually restoring it back to the way it's supposed to be. It's a little taste of what he's getting ready to do for, the, for all of creation. He's going to restore all things, amen? When Jesus healed the sick and when he cast out demons, he was casting out and binding and, and turning back the powers of destruction that had wreaked havoc in his perfect creation. And he was restoring his most prized creation, human beings that he loved back to their intended state. So his miracles seem supernatural. They seem out of order to us, but they were maybe to him the most natural thing that ever truly happened in a world that had been unnaturally demonized and wounded by sin. Of course, we're talking about when Jesus was on the earth, when he was physically here, when he was walking around and, and coming on into contact with these people. But what about now? What about now when he's seated at the right hand of the Father? What about now when he seems far away? Well, what does the Bible say? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is, a, he is in heaven far away, but he's also right here in our midst. Right here. How many times did Jesus say that to his disciples? Hey, if just two or three of you get together... I'm right there with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you even to the end of the age. You're not alone. I'm with you. And lo, I will be with you. He is at the right hand of the Father, but what's he doing at the right hand of the Father? He's making intercession. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And when he does, it brings him joy. You know, sometimes I think we think about Jesus making intercession for us and we have this picture of Jesus going, man, they did it again. I can't believe. Lord, would you just overlook this? Because I I know it's, I know, I know, but that's not, that's not the way it works. He's joyfully bringing us before the Father to help us because that brings him joy. When you think about what, what would bring Jesus joy, typically probably what, what I think about is, well, when I, whenever I finally obey, that, that brings him joy. And it does bring him joy when I obey. I mean, 
I'm looking at all the parents and, and we just let all the little kids go, right? What brings you, does it bring you joy when your kids obey? Yeah, it does. Does it bring you joy when you can help your kids? Yeah, it does. Does it bring you joy when you can comfort your kids or your grandchildren? I mean, wouldn't it be great, you know, when this, have you ever had one of these moments where the little child is just distraught? Just, it's the end of the world and they've, they've melted down in tears because their life is over because they've dropped their lollipop, you know, or their, their ice cream cone, the, the ice cream fell out of it. I mean, it is the end of the world, right? Wow! Isn't, it, wouldn't it, isn't that neat to be a grandpa to pick up that child and say, guess what? We'll get another one. It's not the end of the world. I've got a lollipop right here in my pocket. Here you go. And I fixed your problem. And they're like, all of a sudden the tears go away and like, this is great. Imagine you're a doctor. Let's say you have a cure for a a horribly disfiguring, terrible disease. And you have the cure. And you have unlimited funds. You can, you can just do anything. And so you build all these factories to build the, 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 to distribute the cure and you buy all these trucks and you build hospitals. And would that bring you great joy? Yes, it would bring you great joy. But what if nobody ever came into your hospital and nobody ever received the cure for their disease? And they just, they just walked by and they said, Oh, that can't help me. I'll just take care of it myself. What would bring you joy is when people actually came into your hospital in their, their broken down, disfigured, terrible state, and they received this cure that you had, you had worked hard to produce, and they were healed. They were restored. Jesus is the cure. He has the cure, and He is the cure. Amen? For the fall of man. His life and death and resurrection is the cure and his greatest joy is when we come to him with all of our burdens and all of our suffering and all of our trouble and all of our mess. And he brings us before his heavenly father. Come. Did we sing that this morning? Bring all your, I told, I told, I told Gabe, I said, all those bring alls, all those bring alls were the perfect lyric for today. Bring your addiction. Bring your whatever. That thing that we're, we're trying to hide, that thing we're trying to cover up, that thing that we're, that's making us run away from God. Come unto me. Bring it all. In Hebrews 12, where it, where it writes about Jesus enduring the cross, it says that he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Guess what the joy was? The joy was your healing, your restoration. I'm talking about your healing from sin. And sometimes he does heal our physical problems in our body. But there's coming a day when all of that's going to be wiped away. All of it's going to be taken care of because of his death and resurrection. He endured the cross for the joy set before him. And the joy set before him was to see us forgiven. To see us restored back into relationship with God. What was his prayer in John 17, right? It was, it was right before his crucifixion. He was praying for his disciples and he gets to the end of that prayer in John 17, 24. He says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you gave me before, before the, before the earth. And then he adds this, because you loved me. I want them to know this love. Jesus says, I long for them to be with, did you know that Jesus longed for something? Even though he's been given a name that's above every name and seated at the highest place and been made to be the head over all things. I mean, he's got it all except for one thing that he longs for. And the thing that he longs for is for to be with, to be with you. Isn't that cool? And the only reason he's waiting is so some more can come. According to First Peter. He longs to be with you. And if that's how he feels about you, don't you think... He thinks about you when you're hurting. 
I mean, have you ever been separated from somebody that, that you loved and maybe gotten a letter or an email or something and it says, you know, I, I'm, I, I have, I'm hurt. Whether it's a physical hurt or an emotional hurt or even a financial hurt and you read that message and you go, oh, how I long to be with them and how I long to help them and how I wish I could fix this issue. We are a part of his body. The Bible says a bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not snuff out. You ever feel like you're on a bruised reed? I just, I'm about ready to snap. He says, I'm, I'm not going to let you snap. When we draw on his grace and his mercy and receive his love, that brings him joy. So I want to I want to close with this, the scripture that we read earlier from Hebrews chapter four, Hebrews four fourteen through sixteen. Therefore, since we have already past tense, it's already happened. We have a great high priest that took place two thousand years ago. He was the sacrifice. He was the priest. He took his blood to heaven. He poured it on the mercy seat. A high priest who has ascended into heaven. The atonement work has been finished. Then we get the name. that We know who this high priest is. It's Jesus, the Son of God. Since this is true, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Let's don't be, let's don't be uh, uh, in fear, running away. Let's hold firmly to it. 15. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness. In other words, we do have a high priest who is able to empathize in our weakness. Empathize is a different word than sympathize. Empathize means he knows exactly what it feels like. In fact, he's feeling what you're feeling. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Are you kidding me? Jesus was tempted in every way. Even the ways that I struggle with, even the ways that I'm ashamed of. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Back up. I'm going to need to talk about that a bit more. In fact, Jesus feels, he's felt how hard temptation is even harder than we have. Because he did not sin. All of us know how hard temptation is. And eventually, we have given in to it. He never did. Right? It's like, it's like a man, this is a, this is a quote from C.S. Lewis that I'm borrowing right now. A man walking into a strong headwind, and it's really, 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 really hard. And eventually, he, he becomes so weak that he just turns his back and he lays down. So the wind, he doesn't have to face the wind anymore. That's what we do when we give in to temptation. Jesus never gave in to it. He never, he com- completely walked uh, in his entire life. He had the headwind his entire life. So what's the outcome? Since we have that, since we have that high priest, since, since he did not give in, since he was able to be the sacrifice, now let's go to 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. the outcome when I know this truth I approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help look at all those little prepositional phrases with confidence receive mercy find grace to help aren't those all good things isn't that stuff that we need in our time of need in our time of need because we have this absolutely perfect wonderful holy righteous high priest son of God divine savior who became a human being just like we are took on our form took on our flesh and in both of those things this, this, this is true He doesn't look at us and say, oh, come on, you can do better than that. 
clean yourself up. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Instead, he gets right down into the stinking, ugly mess of humanity, into the miry clay, and he pulls us out as, as only his sinless, divine self can, and he sets our feet on the rock, the solid rock that we sang about this morning, and then he cleans us up. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's stand. Lord, I'm continually amazed that you have this repeated refrain that you say to humanity, come, come, come unto me, come to me, come to me. Even though we're we're a mess, come to me. I'm thinking about that that mom that has a little child that's that's fallen down and with it, with it, and, they're, and they maybe fell down in the mud and they and they skin their knees and they're crying and they're and then what does that mom do? Come to me, come to me. It's okay. I don't care if you crawl out. I don't care if you get blood on me. I don't care if you get mud on me. Just come to me in your mess because I want to scoop you up and I want to love you and I want to help you. That's your heart. We're so thankful, Lord. We don't serve a God like the Muslims do or the Hindus do. That It's an angry God that wants to destroy them. We serve a God who so loved us. And he gave his only son. Help us, Lord, to to really begin to understand your love for us so that we come to you and find rest.